Welcome, Fischer. Let's rock and roll. <laughs> Okay, well, um, well, thanks everyone for coming, um, and apologies uh, for speaking in English. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to hear me try to speak in Swedish. I, um, I always find it really odd coming to an, um, someone else's country and, and speaking my own language. It seems really odd to me. But uh, thank you for putting up with it. Okay, um, so um, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is really the t two main lines of my work, I suppose, and the two main terms with which I've been associated um, over the past um, six or seven years. One you've already heard, which is capitalist realism, um, a political notion, um, or, or, an, or an ideological descriptor, one might say. Um, and on the other hand, um, ontology, a term which has, I'm sure, many of you know, originally came from Jacques Derrida, but which really has got repurposed um, over the course of the last five or six years, um, particularly in relation to, to music. Um, and what I want to do today is bring together these two terms, which I think are two sides of the same phenomenon, actually. That um, what capitalist realism blocks out uh, is what ontology mourns for, longs for, um, and seeks a return of. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with um, three epigraphs, as it were. Um, one of which is um, a piece of music, and then two um, uh, sections from um, recent or fairly recent books. Because um, what I want to do today, really, is um, connect up uh, these concept, the concepts of capitalist realism and the, the concepts of capitalist realism and ontology with um, the issue of what I'm starting to think of as a kind of digital malaise or digital um, or pathologies of the digital. Um, I think that just as we're at a moment when um, we're seeing a rising tide of global milit militancy um, against capitalism, we're also seeing a kind of uh, growing scepticism, disenchantment about the forms that digital culture is taking. Um, I've noticed this sort of anecdotally over the last few months in particular, a number of people really sort of uh, reaching a, a point of kind of weariness and despair with cyberspace. Um, but as I suggest in the title of this um, presentation today, it's not, for me, the issue is not just cyberspace. Um, it's cyberspace time. Uh, and perhaps what I want to suggest um, is that there's a dimension of capitalist realism and um, of hauntology, which has to do with these crises of cyberspace time. Um, I think, you know, we've been online uh, practically for a decade now. Um, and perhaps only now are we really starting to see what it's doing to us. And part of the issue here is how do we articulate any kind of critique of digital culture without sounding like conservatives? And um, I think there's a parallel with um, the way that neoliberalism took over the notion of modernity, modernization, so that it became synonymous. Um, there's a parallel with that, with the way that communicative capitalism or digital culture has also taken over the notion of the future. Um, if we, if we are to resist communicative, cap communicative capitalism, or the, the form that sort of digital sociality now takes, it seems that we can only do so from a position of retrenchment or uh, reaction. Um, and you know, th this, for me, poses the problem of capitalist realism in a different way, or, uh, or, or rather, uh, we, can, we can see that the, the, 
the set of issues that I associate with capitalist realism from a different angle when we look at it in the light of um, the digital or, or of communicative capitalism. Okay, so um, that's the introduction to the introduction. Right, okay. That's, I'm now just going to um, do the three epigraphs. Okay, so first then uh, a piece of music. Too loud. Reluctantly, I'm going to deprive you of the bass, though. Um, but okay. Secondly, then um, a section um, from Franco Berardi's book, um, "Precarious Rhapsody." Um, Could you say again what the music? Oh, the music! I didn't actually, I, I didn't tell you at all what the music was. The music was "Burial." That's a track um, called "You Hurt Me." It's from his first album, 2006, I think. Um, I'll talk about it in a, a bit, in, in, in a second. Um, okay, and this is from Franco Berardi's book, um, Precarious Rhapsody, which um, was 2009. There, uh, Berardi argues, the acceleration of information exchange has produced and is producing an effect of a pathological type on the individual human mind and even more on the collective mind. Individuals are not in a position to consciously process the immense and always growing mass of information that enters their computers, their cell phones, their telephone, the television screens, their electronic diaries and their heads. However, it seems indispensable to follow, recognize evaluate, process all this information if you want to be efficient, effective, victorious. The practice of multitasking, the opening of a window of hypertextual attention, the passage from one context to another for the complex evaluation of processes tends to deform the sequential modality of mental processing. According to Christian Marazzi, who has concerned himself in various books with the relations between economics, language and affectivity, the latest generation of economic operators is affected by a real and proper form of dyslexia, incapable of reading a page from the beginning to the end according to sequential procedures, incapable of maintaining concentrated attention on the same object for a long time. And dyslexia spreads to cognitive and social behaviours, leading, uh, um, leading to rendering the pursuit of linear strategies nearly impossible. And he continues. Today's psychopathy reveals itself ever more clearly as a social epidemic. 
and more precisely, a socio-communicational one. If you want to survive, you have to be competitive. And if you want to be competitive, you must be connected. Receive and process continuously an immense and growing mass of data. This provokes a constant attentive stress, a reduction of the time available for affectivity. These two tendencies, inseparably linked, provoke an effect of devastation on the individual psyche. Depression, panic, anxiety, the sense of solitude and existential misery. But these individual symptoms cannot be indefinitely isolated, as psychopathology has up, done up until now, and as economic power wishes to do. It's not possible to say, you're exhausted, go and take a, va a vacation at Club Med, take a pill, make a cure, get the hell away from it all, recover in the psychiatric hospital, kill yourself. It's no longer possible for the simple reason that it's no longer a matter of a small minority of crazies or a marginal amount of depressives. It concerns a growing mass of existential misery that is tending more to explode in the center of the social system. Okay, and third epigraph then from um, this recent book by the um, cyber theorist, the psychoanalytically trained cyber theorist, Sherry Terkel. Um, These days, uh, she writes, um, being connected depends not on our distance from each other, but from available communications technology. Most of the time, we carry that technology with us. In fact, being alone can start to seem like a precondition for being together, because it's easier to communicate if you can focus without interruption on your screen. In this new regime, a train station, like an airport, a cafe, or a park, is no longer a communal space, but a place of social collection. People come together, but do not speak to each other. Each is tethered to a mobile device and to the people and places which that device serves as a portal. A place that used to comprise a physical space and the people within it. What is a place if those who are physically present have their attention on the absent? At a cafe a block from my home, almost everyone is on a computer or smartphone as they drink their coffee. These people are not my friends, yet somehow I miss their presence. Okay, I'm sure that we can all recognize that phenomenon that, that Terkel describes there. Um, in fact, something that we increasingly take for granted. Um, but I think I want to suggest that those three things that we just heard are profoundly connected. Um, Burial. When I first heard the burial record uh, in 2006, and I thought it was one of the most important records of the decade, and I retain that belief. I think it was one of the most important cultural statements really to come out of um, the UK in the first decade of the 21st century, really. Um, really, that, that first album, the self-titled album, Burial, and the second one, um, Untitled, uh, form a kind of um, single piece in lots of ways. Um, and a kind of affective portrait of what it was like to live in the UK in the early part of the 21st century. Um, and you, you probably noticed there that um, in Burial Sound, um, the relation to dance music the relation to the you know, UK dance music of the 90s. Um, and one way into this notion of hauntology is um, to the hearing double that one is required to do when you're confronted with um, tracks by burial. What I mean by hearing double is um, it's a bit like walking into a building, um, a dilapidated or derelict building, um, and remembering what that building once looked like. Um, and that's not an idle <coughs> metaphor in connection with burial, whose music is, is sort of full of um, music concrete type samples which suggest spaces and derelicted or dilapidated spaces. Um, of course, in burial's case, what's significant about these spaces is that they were the sites of collective delirium. Um, that 
the, what we're hearing double the, the, the spectral traces of the other music that we're hearing alongside <coughs> its kind of dilapidated form, you know, is the music inspired by the UK rave scene, really. Excuse me, yeah. this word, dilapidated, what does it mean? Oh, uh, fallen into disrepair or ruin, yeah. Yeah, please, uh, no, an anybody, any point, uh, uh, you can ask me anything. Uh, uh, it's the only way we're going to get through this. <laughs> so yeah, if, 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 you, if, if I, you know, if I say something you just don't understand, or, or if you just want to ask me anything, any point, you know, that's what I'm used to. You know, I started off teaching uh, like 16 to 19 year olds in the UK. They won't listen for more than 90 seconds, and uh, <laughs> that's part of this part of this uh, attentional deficit regime that I sort of uh, that was just referred to. Really, so. I kind of get a bit of a nosebleed and vertigo if I can if I talk for very long without people asking me questions. So um, please go ahead. <laughs> anyway, so, so yes, so um, so with the, the, so the power of the, the, the burial record for me was that it was quite clearly about expressing um, a certain sense of space, um, and um, express, uh, expressing a sense of that space as now being denuded, emptied out, um, and there's a kind of mourning. Um, a mourning for what um, had once taken place in these spaces. And that, and that, that mourning was formally signified by that, um, the echoes of UK dance music of the 90s, particularly um, jungle drum, bass and garage. So what's significant, really, about the decade we've just lived through um, in terms of UK music and UK dance music in particular is the massive slowing down in the rate of change or innovation that has occurred. And this is perhaps one of the first sort of antimonies or, or paradoxes I'd want to point to. Um, it's one that actually Frederick Jameson had noted um, really quite a long time ago, in, uh, in the 80s and early 90s, and um, the longer the time goes on, the more prophetic I s feel that um, Frederick Jameson's work is, actually, for noting these trends um, long before they were um, clear to, to um, the rest of us. Um, well, that particular paradox is that, okay, we've, we've in a, particularly in the last 10 years, We've lived through massive changes um, in culture at a formal level, or that, that certainly the level of the distribution and consumption of culture. Uh, really, uh, changes that uh, are, are unimaginable, actually, uh, almost, um, from, the, the, from the perspective of the late 90s. You know, bear in mind that you know, the iPod only really took off in 2005. You know that that that's you know that seems like a thre massive threshold, doesn't it? That seems like that that um, it, you can such that we can barely believe it's only five or six years ago that that happened. Um, so you know, with the emergence of MP3s, peer-to-peer, etc., um, the end of um, CDs or the, or the the virtual end of CDs, of course, old people still buy them, but um, <laughs> like that, uh, it's impossible to imagine, isn't it, really, in 10 years' time, um, young people buying recorded music, paying for recorded music, that's, that's, a, uh, it, that's already kind of a totally anachronistic to lots of um, young teenagers uh, or, 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 or people younger than that, you know, who don't even uh, don't even have MP3s now. They're not. They're more likely if they, if they listen to music to get it via YouTube or or, or such like. But okay, so that, that's we, we can when we take a step back and we can all think, okay, that's a massive change in consumption and distribution of, of of music that's happened over the last ten years. Yet, at a cultural level, at the, at the level of the, at the level of content of culture, rather rather than the sort of form in which we consume it. 
there's a massive deceleration. Um, that, you know, the, the example I mentioned of the UK dance music, where, you know, forms of music would emerge in the 90s um, that were sonically unimaginable only a short time before. Something like um, jungle drum and bass. You couldn't have conceived of anything like that. You know, even a year or two before it actually emerged, you couldn't have conceived of anything like that. So when it actually emerged, it was, it was a sudden eruption, and a, a rush of the, uh, of the future coming in. And there was a whole succession of these developments in, in the 90s. You struggle to find anything of that sort in, in the 21st century. Um, now, um, we can s it's c because we can f the mainstream, one could say, that uh, mainstream popular music or whatever had been slowing down for some time, perhaps. Um, but it's possible to ignore that. You know, th th well, for instance, in, in the UK, we had the miserable, miserable spectacle of things like Britpop in the 90s. You know, the pathetic kind of attempt to pretend it was the 60s again and all of that, and the return of rock and lads and stuff, and, and all of that horror. Okay, so, th but that, so that was going on in mainstream culture, but there was an alternative to it, which, which, you, could, which you could cling on to uh, in the 90s. Um, is the problem in the, the last decade is that uh, those places where you would go for an alternative to um, mainstream kind of retrospection and kitsch have themselves become subject to, to entropy. Um, and it's not that nothing is happening in these zones, um, but it's happening in a much smaller way and um, <laughs> in, a, in a much less dramatic way. Um, and for me, this is part of why burial was important, because burial kind of acknowledged that um, at the same time as um, his music kind of wouldn't accept it. Um, you know, Barry himself, I should say, is young. I mean, he's only in his, um, he's a bit of a mysterious figure, but I think he's in sort of mid-20s, I'd, um, I'd guess. And, and part of what's interesting about the phenomenon of Burial uh, is, is a nostalgia for something which he himself didn't experience. And this is an increasing phenomenon. In fact, Sherry talk Turkle talks about this quite poignant anecdote in this book, which is called Alone Together, which just came out a few months ago, um, where, she, where, she, um, uh, where she interviews a number of people about their experiences with digital communications media, like that, um, an awful lot of people. And one of the young people she speaks to says, uh, yeah, well, wouldn't it have been great when you could just you know, write letters and stuff? I mean, I, I'm, I, I don't remember it, but I'm nostalgic for it. I never lived through this, but I, I'm nostalgic for it. Um, and Burial was similar, and Burial didn't experience a wraith himself. Um, as he told me when I interviewed him, um, his contact with wraith came by a, a, he had a brother who was significantly older than him. Um, so uh, when his brother would come back into the house, um, you know, he would come with these tales of going to raves, he'd come with these mixtapes, um, etc. So Burial had that contact with this um, lost world of delirious collectivity um, via the, the, the close relative. Um, so, there's a st so in Burial's music, there's that sense of loss, uh, loss of something which he himself didn't have, but nevertheless loss which he can... Um, he can feel he can feel the loss, um, and he can arti articulate the loss. Um, but I think what also comes out in Burial's music is the sense of existential misery that um, Berardi talked about. It's a music that's saturated with sadness, and of course. Um, part of the reason for that sadness is the disappearance of popular collectivity itself, you could say. The popular collectivity of 
associated with dance music. Um, and that's one of the characteristics or properties I'd want to stress in relation to hauntology, really, is um, there's a mourning for modes of collectivity that have disappeared. But there's also, uh, I think, what also comes out in Burial's music, because of its strong and vivid sense of spatiality, um, is a mourning for the disappearance of the public spaces that Sherry Turkle talks about. Um, that sense that we are alone together, that what this new digital connected world has brought is in lots of ways new forms of solitude. Um, I think that's, um, that sense of solitude is part of uh, why Burial's music became so important, why it connected with so many different people, um, in, um, why it has connected with so many people in, in the last few years. Okay then, just to take a sort of further step back then, um, and, and just to, just to fill people in on what I mean by capitalist realism, um, and to draw out the comparison with with ontology. Okay, well, capitalist realism um, is, pr in some sense, hard to define, but it's easy to spot once you know what <laughs> once you know what it is. Um, capitalist realism can be described succinctly. Um, as the belief, although it's not quite a psychological belief in any ordinary sense, um, that, to use a phrase um, attributed both to Slavoj Žižek and to Frederick Jameson, um, that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Um, that, in other words, um, Margaret Thatcher's notorious um, claim made in the 80s that, that there is no alternative to capitalism, to neoliberal capitalism, um, has c ceased to be uh, a, a, a sort well, of changed its meaning. We could say that when Thatcher made that claim in the 80s, she was speaking preferentially. There's no alternative to, to capitalism because all of the other all the alternatives are worse than this. Um, now, it has an ontological sense. There's no alternative because we cannot imagine there being uh, any um, alternative scenario, um, any alternative form of so, um, social or economic organisation. Um, and capitalist realism isn't just there being pushed by neoliberal ideologues. Um, it's in us as well. Um, and... I think nothing illustrates this more clearly than the real widespread failure of the so-called left, if, we, if there was any such thing anymore in, in, um, in parliamentary terms, you know, in, the, in Europe, to have taken advantage of the most spectacular failure of a political project ever, probably, you know, which was the, um, the financial crisis and the, the, the bank bailouts. Um, of 2008, um, you know, if, if, if ever a system, if, if ever a political uh, credo has, has failed, uh, has one ever failed so dramatically as, as, as neoliberalism did there? Remember that, you know, the, the key idea of neoliberalism, that, um, well, that, that all, all of the ideas fell, all of them. You know, one that, the one that the, the markets, so-called markets, run things more efficiently, than states. And alongside that one, it presupposes a distinction between markets and the states at all. You know, this, th both of those went down big style. Because, you know, big time. You know, big, that, uh, you know, um, throughout, I mean, one form of capitalist realism, which, um, you know, we were endlessly subject to in the UK working public services, was this idea that, uh, you know, business runs things better. Business, you know, things should be run like businesses. 
you know, well, now we can see that, you know, if even businesses can't be run by like businesses, why should public services, quite honestly? But the, the, no, but I mean, so, th so that, that, that idea, I mean, <laughs> that, that, uh, that idea that, uh, you know, f uh, you know, business or markets runs things better, well, um, you know, no matter what the scale of a kind of uh, state fuck up, you know, it would really have to struggle to compete with the, 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 the scale of the, the bank bailouts, wouldn't it, really? You'd, you'd really struggle to think of anything that could compete with that. Um, but also, um, as, I, uh, as I said, we, this whole, the whole operating opposition here, the idea that, that um, so-called markets um, were ever separate from the state, is, no, is retrospectively revealed to be nonsense. Because if the state was going to bail out markets, they were, they're already a part of the state anyway. They're, they're, they're always already a part of it, you might say. Um, OK, this is a, 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 a total disaster, and f catastrophe for neoliberalism. So what? <laughs> you know, the, the, the point is that uh, I think we can see that, the, that what capitalist realism is by the fact that the, even that a, a, a disaster, a catastrophe of that magnitude, you know, utterly changing. I mean, what can, what could be said? You know, um, what could be said in, in mainstream discourse? You know, um, a week before those bank bailouts, no one would dare question the idea that markets had sovereign wisdom. Suddenly, afterwards, you, you, you could, ma you know, you could forget people like Gordon Brown going, "Well, maybe markets can make mistakes and stuff." That, 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 I mean, that, but even a concession of that sort was really massive. Yet. So what? In lots of ways, that 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 as uh, the fact that neoliberalism has lost credibility um, and um, has been in every sense discredited um, doesn't stop it rolling on. Um, why not? Well, because there's no alternative story that's cr that, that that is credible. Um, there's no, uh, there are no institutions or organizations which could um, institute that story even if um, it were there. Um, so neoliberalism has been allowed to continue in this undead form. And you know, it can continue in the undead form forever. You know, that's the nature of the undead. Um, that, and that's <laughs> It's, you know, and, and this is worth to say, that it's just, it's, you know, it is easier to kill the living than to kill the undead, I'm afraid, in lots of ways. So, the, 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 you know, where, where was, where, where, you know, where was the, the, the any sort of left in Europe that could take advantage of this? Nowhere. Now, th this is not a problem of... Um, I'm not suggesting a sort of a sort of moral failing or a, even a strategic one. It's just that you know that clearly the conditions weren't there for the for for the left to. Uh, if, as I say, if we can even talk about the left anymore as an agent, if that if that term makes any sense anymore, the, the, clearly the conditions weren't there um, for the for the left to mount any sort of assault, even though there was the most massive open goal in, in a sort of political history in lots of ways. Um, okay, so that's. That's part. That's partly what I mean by capitalist realism, um, because you know it has this. I mean, ha how has capitalist realism been, um, how does capitalist realism emerge in the first place? Um, well, um, not so much by directly persuading people of its truth, um, but by removing uh, institutions or, or organisations which could challenge it. Um, in the UK, the most obvious example of that was trade unions. Um, you know, in this period when Mrs. Thatcher is making the claim, you know, there was there was no alternative. Um, she's fighting a you know a, a famous war against the NUM, the National Union uh, of Mine Workers, um, and the defeat of the miners, you know, who uh, had themselves. Um, defeated the Tory government, the Conservative government, ten years previously. The defeat of the miners is of massive symbolic as well as strategic significance. Um, 
it means that, to come back to what I was saying a few minutes ago, that the, um, the neoliberal right now has control of modernity. Um, part of what was part of the struggle I put, uh, uh, in that strike in the UK was the, was about uh, really who, where is history going, and that the um, neoliberals were successfully able to paint the left as belonging to the past, hidebound, and um, certainly in the UK and I think also elsewhere in Europe, the left has ne never really recovered from that. It's gone into a crisis that it has, ne that has never come out of. Um, so, so what that meant is, with the, with the removal of trade unions on the one hand, and also, so it's a carrot and stick kind of procedure, evidently. So you, you attack forms of collective representation, and, but you also induce people uh, into kind of consumer individuation. Um, and, you know, how that worked in the UK was, um, well, look, you know, uh, why those lefty bureaucrats, they want to stop you owning your own council house, you know? Why would you... Why would you uh, why would, you, why would you want to support them? We want to give you. We want to. We, we want to let you own your own house. You know. You, you want to choose to be able to do that, don't you? And who wouldn't, as it were? Um, you know. Um, nationalised industries, completely inefficient. Look how bad the railways are. Uh, you know, British rail rubbish. Right. Uh, it'd be much better if it's run by um, uh, private companies. Uh, well, if you've ever spent any time in the UK on a rail service in the last 20 years, you know what <laughs> nonsense that is. But you know, and also, you know, not only will this, the, you know, we, we sell this off, uh, they'll, you'll be able to buy shares in it. Okay, so this double process of uh, consigning the agents of kind of working class solidarity into the past, um, and the same time as um, these inducements into kind of um, consumer culture, and of course, uh, the emergence of credit. Um, the credit wasn't given to um, workers by the largesse of capital, evidently. You know, it was given to them because, is in order to keep wages low in real terms. Um, and this is one thing we should bear in mind at the moment. I, th uh, um, I think we've, we've, we've got as a decadent capital capitalist ruling class, which has forgotten why it needed to give inducements to um, workers in the first place, actually. Uh, which was that you know if, if you don't if, if you don't do that they they do they do get a bit discontented etc. And that I mean that, uh, I think that has been forgotten and the, the the austerity measures that have been brought in across Europe um, are to say the least uh, not likely to um, damp down discontent. Um, but we can come back to that. Anyway. But okay, so that's the, the the kind of political economic background to capitalist realism. Um, but I also saw that there was a cultural problem, and it really um, that was expressed in terms of this precisely this uh, inertia, retrospection, um, sterility, um, this sense of endless kind of repetition, um, recirculation of the already familiar. Um, in other words, uh, it's a form of a sort of aggravated postmodernism, you could say. Um, and here, in particular, I'm thinking of the theorization of postmodernism that came from Frederick Jameson. Um, Jameson's idea, which interestingly never really explains, as far as I can see, uh, the, why this happens. Um, the idea that the, te the tendency would be for culture to move away from um, the new. Um, and move towards a kind of mode of pastiche. Um, what's interesting about uh, what's interesting about that move towards pastiche, though, is that it's largely disavowed. Um, if you, you know, if you put this to people, people say, "Well, there's always been retro and revival. There's nothing new about it." Well, that's true, uh, but we've got a, with, what we've got is an increasingly disavowed form of. Um, retrospection in culture now. 
And again, this is something that Jameson understood very early on. Um, his example of this was a largely forgotten film um, called Body Heat, starred um, William Hurt and Kathleen Turner. And what Jameson noted was something that was very peculiar about that film, but which again I think we, we largely take for granted now. That although that film was set in um, the modern day, th what was then the modern day, which was the mid-80s, it didn't feel like it was set in the modern the, the 80s at all. Um, the way it was shot, that dialogue, the music, um, the film stock, um, all of that conjured a feeling of the film noirs of the sort of kind of 40s. Yet, um, this formal, these formal retrospective tendencies were never explicitly acknowledged in the film. So you've got this double kind of, um, again, you've got this double kind of uh, quality to what you're seeing. Um, it feels old, but we're told that it's new. Um, and I think we, could, uh, we can see this kind of, uh, <coughs> um, this kind of bizarre anachronism, or rather naturalized bizarre anachronism, um, more and more across culture. Um, in the UK, um, at the moment, we've got all kinds of miserable examples of this in music. Um, you know, Duffy, um, um, Adele, um, well, Arctic Monkeys. Uh, you know, this is true. My anecdote about the Arctic Monkeys. Like they, when I first heard the Arctic Monkeys, and this isn't true, no word of a lie, uh, I thought, well, it, well actually, it didn't, it didn't hear them. I saw them. I saw the video for I Bet She Looks Good on the Dance Floor. And I thought, oh, wow. Well, I uh, well, didn't think, wow. Uh, it's more like, oh, <laughs> oh, here's some post-punk group from 1978-9 that I had not actually heard before. Um, why do I think that? Well, because every th everything about the sound, at least on a superficial listening, I'm not saying... I'm sure experts can come out and say, well, there's a compression on that, you know, you couldn't have had it back in those days. But on a superficial, the most visceral kind of lump and level of, of actually hearing the sound, you know, it sounded like something that you could have put on the radio in 1980 and no one would have looked up from their cornflakes. You know, when, when it's, you know, that line about, um, you know, uh, a robot from 1984 or whatever, I thought that was about the future when, you know, at the time. And, uh, you know, that, and it wasn't only, that, it wasn't only the, uh, the sound of it, it was also the formal properties of the, uh, the way that the video had been shot. His hair, the T-shirt, the lighting, the studio, everything about it um, very closely recalled the, um, the BBC sort of serious rock show, which was the old Grey Whistle Test. It, lo it looked like, that's what I thought it was. I thought, this is some group from the old Grey Whistle Test from 1980. And, okay. Uh, there's always been retrospection, you know, we had Shawadi Wadi and Shanana in the 70s. Pe people drew attention to that. It was marketed, that was its genre, pigeonhole, you know, retro. This wasn't an issue for the, the Arctic Monkeys. It just wasn't brought, it was no longer an issue anymore. It was even an issue for Oasis, I think, to some degree, in the 90s. But by the, t by, by the time of, you know, the f 21st century, it's, it's ceasing to be an issue anymore. Because why? Because we've got no sense of forward movement of culture now. Um, we've got no uh, we've got no sense of what it is to be in in 2011 in lots of ways. And why is why is music particularly important for that? Well, because um, music used to be precisely that thing which you would um, which would most uh, reliably provide that kind of dating of a particular period. I mean, you, this is exploited uh, to the um, exploit the level of cliche, isn't it, by um, uh, filmmakers and television program makers? You know, uh, you know, if they're really bad at it, if it's 1973, it must be sweet. You know, if it's, it must be glam rock. You know, and it's, that, that if you want to bring back a period, but I mean, I really would struggle if you, to, you know, if someone said, right, give me the sound of 2003, sound of 2004. What's that? Uh, I don't know. Sound of you know 75, 76. I've got a fair clue about that. Um, and that isn't because I'm paying less attention. I was paying more attention in the last decade in the sense that I was a music critic. You know, I was just sort of around in the 70s and so as a, as a, well, not even particularly aware, you know, of what's going on. Um, other examples, um, another one, which is another true one, um, 
uh, uh, Amy Winehouse. Uh, when, I, when I first heard um, her version of the Zootons, oh God, uh, even the name makes you feel slightly sick. So, for the, uh, the Zootons of Valerie, I heard that and I was in a shop. And, uh, I, and, you know, it's the Mark Ronson 60s kind of pastiche. Um, of course, if you listen to it closely, you realise that it couldn't have come out in the 60s. But again, on a casual listen, you're walking through a shop, I thought, oh, I didn't realise this was an old song, and that the Zootons was a cover of this old song from the 60s. Again, no real issue about it. Like, it's totally retrospective in almost all its dimensions, that song. Um, and that, well, that version of the song. No issue is made of it. Uh, it's no longer a special category of, re of, of, of retro or nostalgia. It's just ordinary pop music, as it were. Um, and so, so I think this brings out this dimension of, uh, that, of that sort of cultural expression of, of, of kind of capitalist realism, I think. Um, which, as I say, is that aggravated postmodernism. Now, um, the, um, you can see a kind of succession here, I think. You know, Jameson himself starts off as a pretty old-school Adornoite modernist, you know, that he thinks, okay, like, like Adorno. Um, there's, uh, you know, a lot of mass culture might be rubbish, but, we c but it doesn't matter because we still can turn to the denaturalizing power of, you know, modern art, you know, which is separate from the marketplace, which is new, uh, which can only have been made in this time, and which is in some sense rebarbative, you know, it's not, um, it's not really amenable to um, uh, um, immediate pleasure. You have to learn to, uh, to enjoy it, okay, all of, the, all of those familiar features of, of the kind of modernist art object. But, you know, James is one of the first to realise that this collapses. That for one thing, that the Modern, that the energy of culture goes out of modernism, that uh, secondly, that the distinction between high and low culture, on which something like Adorno's work depends, collapses. Um, that f far from being some kind of pristine zone, um, immune to commodification, um, that modernism actually acts as the kind of avant-garde for capitalism, so that what, you know, what starts off as um, a modernist art object becomes advertising, etc. Um, and then, you know, so when Jameson's first writing about postmodernism, he's noting this kind of ironic quotation of um, former object of modernism in the space of what used to be called popular culture. But we can't really call it popular culture anymore because in lots of ways there's no alternative to popular culture. Everything has collapsed into that, and what's left is this. Um, um, what's left outside are various forms of kind of kitsch, you know, um, that, that sort of do survive, but they have no. They, they no longer have a convincing claim on to, to uh, articulate the essential energies of the society in which they belong. And so the, you know, the, so there's initially that stage. I think when Jameson's writing, um, we can see a kind of staging of a confrontation between. Um, postmodern practice and theory, and the sort of remaining elements of modernism. But I think, effectively, we've reached the third phase now, where modernism is so forgotten, the claims of modernism, the idea of a separate culture um, that is superior, is not, it's not only forgotten, but it also is, is attacked and undermined as elitist in, in various ways. Um, uh, that, that all disappears, uh, and um, as I say, um, features which for Jameson were remarkable are for us simply taken for granted now. Um, and what Jameson was onto very early, and this is you know a lot of it in his book, big book, Postmodernism: All the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. And in a, in a way, I, I guess a lot of my work on capitalist realism takes its cue from that subtitle, really the idea of um, you know Jameson really. A in many ways, reasserting a Marxist grand narrative over postmodernism and saying, actually, we can still understand this in terms of um, lots of the categories that we you know, derive from, from Marxist theory. Um, and that, you know, that the capitalism is, the, it, the capitalism is the key agent here. Um, but just as postmodernism disappears and becomes taken for granted, so does capitalism, as it were. You know, that, you know when, after 1989, when cap capitalism loses 
its visible antagonists um, in the sort of Soviet Empire, um, then capitalism doesn't have to defend itself as such. It just becomes the you know horizon of the imaginable. It doesn't have to be you know that, that, that doesn't have to be named anymore. It's all the more powerful because it's not named. It's just what it's just reality itself, the only imaginable reality. Um, And so th this, uh, th all of this is behind then, I think, this, um, this sense of cultural inertia, the sense of uh, unacknowledged or disavowed kind of exhaustion that increasingly pervades um, culture, I think. Um, now, as I say, it's, uh, Jameson never really says, okay, he, he makes the claim that there is this tendency towards pastiche, um, retrospection. We never really explains why that is the case, actually. Um, and I think my conjecture would be, would have been a number of conjectures. One of them would be, <sighs> and there are hints of this in Jameson anyway, that uh, I'm just drawing out, really, that you know, in times of massive insecurity, um, such as we've lived through, um, in times of massive political, economic insecurity um, and you know job job insecurity, which we've all got used to, you know this uh, we, we've all had to live with this. Um, as Baradi argues in in, in, in this book, uh, you know uh, it used to be entre entrepreneurs it used to be a special class of people. They used to take risks. You know everybody else didn't have to worry about risks mu very much. You know it wasn't wasn't their job to do it. Now, we're, because we're all, as part of what I call capitalist realism, is we, we're all entrepreneurs now. We all have to be entrepreneurs for ourselves. We all have to sell ourselves all the time. Um, we all expect to only be in short-term contracts. If you're in a short-term contract, uh, as I am in all of my jobs, um, then you're effectively applying for your own job all of the time, aren't you? I mean, it just means that, so you're, that that's, you're in this permanent state of anxiety. Um, and, you know, that you can't... Um, it's very hard to make demands about your conditions uh, in, um, in that situation. Um, and, okay, so uh, this in effect is what happens over the, uh, the course of the 1980s, is really a shift from um, a kind of stability of antagonism, you could say, that defined the social de democratic um, period, also known as the Fordist period. Um, where you know we had representatives of workers, trade unions, representatives of business, um, and you know the role of government was essentially to mediate between these two separate interest blocks. Um, if you're a worker, you would expect to uh, be male, <laughs> largely. You would expect to, um, if you wanted to, to work in the same factory for the you know, 40 years of your working life. You expect small inc incremental improvements in your standards of living and pay over the course, course of that life. Um, s small, but you know, that nevertheless, you could predict what your life would be like um, effectively. That all goes. That all goes uh, during the course of, 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 of the 80s. Um, you know, who have, you know, when we look around now, who has a job like that? You know, um, Clearly, some of the important thing is you know, that it's not just a bad development. And, and one of the uh, things that's important to resist, I think, is a nostalgia for Fordism, a nostalgia for, oh, good old social democracy when, w when women didn't work and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, that, uh, and you know, men had boring jobs for 40 years. Great. If, you know, what <laughs> if, okay. there, there are certain benefits of that world in terms of certain kind of psychic stability, which we now absolutely lack. Um, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that uh, we should hanker back for hang, hanker for that world. Uh, in the UK recently, we had a, one of the members of the government, David Willett, said, uh, "Yeah, it's all women's fault." Uh, actually, made the you know, if women hadn't gone into the workforce, everything would be great. <laughs> Which, <yes. laughs> and you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, a certain sense is true. But why would you wouldn't want to go back to that situation where it, that was great? You know, for whom? Um, 